Uh, please open your Bibles to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, we're at the end of the Torah, um, just kind of doing overview messages through the Torah. Um, this helps me just really um, get into the Bible. I really appreciate it, and, and I, I trust that it's encouraging to you as well to see the message of how the Bible begins. Matter of fact, I, I remember from seminary um, hearing about the first five books of Moses kind of set up the entire Bible, right? They set up the themes that you'll see again and will be fleshed out later in the Bible, but everything is in the first five books of the Bible. If you know these books, you know the Bible. You have a, you have a sense for where the Bible is going. And that's especially true of Deuteronomy. Uh, if, you, if you understand Deuteronomy, you understand the good news of the gospel. You understand it in a, in a way that's fantastic. You, you understand the enabling power of the gospel and the joy that is ours in the church age because we have God's spirit, his presence with us. It is a great joy that we have. And this is partially what Deuteronomy has to tell us. But we'll talk about that in a moment. Remember our God, I would say that is kind of the phrase that I think of when I think of Deuteronomy. Remember who your God is. And that is true for us, just as it's true for Israel um, in the time of Moses. Um, um, some things you should know about Deuteronomy to help you read it well. Um, first off, who wrote it? It seems pretty obvious by this point, but all five books of Moses were written by Moses. Um, not a popular opinion, maybe by some, but I would say Deuteronomy, of all the first five books in the Bible, is most explicitly written by Moses, of all of them. Matter of fact, we kind of build the whole argument for Moses writing all of the five books from Moses writing Deuteronomy. But just look at how Deuteronomy uh, describes its author. These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan in the wilderness, Deuteronomy 1.1 says. And then Deuteronomy 1.5 says, across the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to expound this law saying. And then in Deuteronomy 31, near the end of the book, after Deuteronomy has been, or Moses has been preaching for a good while now, Deuteronomy 31, verse 9, says this. So Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Eli, or Levi, to carry, uh, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh and to all the elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them, saying, at the end of every seven years, at the time of the year of the rem uh, remission of debts, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before Yahweh your God, at the place which he will choose, you shall read this law in front of all of Israel in their hearing. Right? He is giving the priests a book. Matter of fact, this is what we see in Joshua 1, verse 8, right? This book of the law shall not depart from you. So Moses is the one explaining the law, commanding the law, but also notice he's writing this down in a book and he's giving it to the priests. That indicates to me that Moses is the author. Now there are parts of Deuteronomy that suggest that Moses isn't the author, like how it records his death, but I, 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 ha I can embrace the idea that maybe Joshua or a later compiler added that uh, ending to the book of Deuteronomy without just saying Moses wrote none of it. I'd say Moses wrote the majority of it with that little addition, uh, addendum put at the very, very end. But it was clearly under the inspiration of the Spirit of God through Moses. That is who wrote it. Um, next off, uh, what is the key word? Key word, think about remember. Think about remember. Now, the word Deuteronomy itself, the name of the book, is a little misleading. It means second law, which comes from a mistranslation of Deuteronomy 17, 18, where the king is commanded to write a mistranslated uh, second law. But really, Deuteronomy is not about a new law or a second law. Moses is simply restating or reminding Israel of the law they heard at Sinai. Now, this is the second generation of Israelites, but he is reminding them of this law that they have already heard. So the key word I would say to you is this, remember. Remember. That is what Moses is trying to do all throughout Deuteronomy. Um, next slide. Um, important question to ask yourself. 
What does God want Israel to remember in the promised land and why? What's so important that we need to remember about our God to, to live in the promised land? And well, why is that valuable? That's a good question to ask yourself while you're reading Deuteronomy. Um, next slide. Um, when and where? When and where? Well, I kind of already gave it away. Deuteronomy, like most of the other books of Moses, was written on the plains of Moab right outside the promised land. You see this in Deuteronomy 1, verse 3. Now it happened in the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that Yahweh had commanded him to give to them. This is Moses' final sermon, and really it's kind of a, a, a kind of a collection of sermons, you could even say. That's what Deuteronomy is. It's, it's basically like Israel is all getting together to hear just a day of preaching. We think about summer camp and how impactful it can be to have just a day of preaching. And this is kind of what Deuteronomy is. It, it's happening in the 40th year of the first day uh, from um, leaving Egypt. They have been in the wilderness for 40 days. As a matter of fact, you can pinpoint this so closely. It is likely January or February of uh, uh, 1405 B.C., according to these uh, factors. Of course, then Moses not only gave this sermon, but then he wrote down this sermon. You see in Deuteronomy 31, he wrote down this sermon for the Israelites to take into the promised land, and he commanded the Israelites to um, read this book um, in the place that the Lord would so choose. Um, no, wait, hold it. And also where? Obviously, Mount. Uh, next slide, yeah, go to the next slide. Uh, the Plains of Moab, here's a picture of perhaps, perhaps around the location where it was. You can see the Dead Sea over there in the upper left-hand corner. You can also see that this picture is taken apparently from like a mountain of some, of some type. That's probably Mount uh, Nebo, which Moses would go up on, see the Promised Land, and die. So here, here's a picture maybe of what Moses was looking at um, or what is described at the end of Deuteronomy when Moses is looking into the promised land. He's looking out past or over the Dead Sea into the promised land. And on a clear day, you can see the whole of Israel. But, but this is where Israel is. They're in the plains of Moab. They're not in the mountain. They're in the plains of Moab, um, looking across the Jordan River into the very promises of God that he has given them. It, it's interesting uh, um, It's interesting that, that Israel has been waiting for 40 years for this moment. 40 years. But now they are on the, the edge of God's promises. Right there, on the banks, you could say, of his promises. Um, let's move on, though. Um, next slide. Why, why was Deuteronomy written? Now, I'm going to kind of give you like a just a general uh, summary of why Deuteronomy is written, and then we'll kind of just walk through Deuteronomy as quickly as we can. But here, here just, just kind of a general statement, and I'm going to take this basic statement from Deuteronomy 4, which I feel like is the, the kind of book of Deuteronomy in summary form. Uh, but here it is. Moses writes to remind the second generation of Israel, or remind the second generation of Israel of... Next slide. The righteousness and wisdom of God's law and covenant. He writes to remind them of God's righteousness and wisdom in the very law itself. You look over at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5, it says, See, I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as Yahweh my God commanded me, that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. You shall keep and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all of these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as is Yahweh our God whenever we call on him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today? Uh, Moses writes to remind them of the law, but he writes to remind them of the law's wisdom and its overall righteousness, its excellence, right? Right? The nations, he says, are going to see the way you live. They're going to even maybe hear of this God of the Torah. 
of the law, and they're going to say, what God is like this? No other God on earth is like this that provides such righteous and wise laws for his people. That's number one. Number one, he reminds them of the righteousness and wisdom of God's law. Number two, he reminds them of the danger of disobedience. And we don't really need much reminders of this. We've seen plenty of this in the book called Numbers. But the dangers of disobedience, he even says in Deuteronomy 4, verse 25, when you become the father of children and children's children and remain long in the land and act corruptly and make a graven image in the form of anything and do that which is evil in the sight of Yahweh your God so as to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will surely perish quickly from the land where you are going over the Jordan to possess it. You shall, <coughs> sorry. You shall not <clears throat> prolong your days on it but will be utterly destroyed. And Yahweh will scatter you among the peoples, and you will remain few in number among the nations where Yahweh drives you. And there you will serve gods, the works of man's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. Right? There's a a natural contrast right there to God. Your God, the living God, the seeing God, the hearing God, right? But no. This is the judgment for disobedience, right? You are going to be scattered. There's going to be none of you or very few of you remaining in the land, and the rest of you will be scattered among the nations, and there you will get all of the idols you want, right? It's a good lesson to remember, right? Sometimes God, in punishment for our sin or discipline for our sin, how does he discipline us? By giving us what we want. Let that fear you. Right? But that's, that's what Moses is here to remind us of, of the danger of disobedience. Right? It's not just that God's going to you know, bat a forgetful eye on your sin. No, he's going to discipline you, and it's going to be painful. And you see that all throughout Deuteronomy, um, the danger of disobedience. But also, number three, um, also to remind us of the amazing nature of God's love so that you can know blessing and not a curse. Moses writes to remind us of the amazing divine quality of the God of love. Yeah, so, some, some people say the Old Testament is about a God of wrath and anger, and the New Testament is about, about a God of love. But then, what do you do with a book like Deuteronomy where it showcases God's love? I mean, it shows him as a severe God, but it shows him as a severe God because he is a absolute loving God, right? You don't sin against such a perfectly loving God without consequences in your life, but Moses writes to remind us of the amazing quality of God's divine love. Deuteronomy 4 verse 32 writes this, right? This is the motivation behind all of the commandments of God, the love of God. This is what motivates his people to obey. Deuteronomy 4.32 says this, Indeed, ask now concerning the former days which were before you since the day that God created man on the earth. Right? Creation, assumed, right? And inquire from the end of the heavens to the other. Has anything been done like this great thing? Or has anything been heard like this? Has any people heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire as you have heard it and lived? Or has a God tried to go and take for himself a nation from within another nation with trials, with signs and wonders, and with war, and with a mighty hand, and with an outstretched arm, and with great terrors as Yahweh, your God, did for you in Egypt before your eyes? To you it was shown that you might know that Yahweh, he is God. There is none other besides him. (laughs) Listen to this, verse 36. Out of the heavens he caused you to hear his voice to discipline you. And on the earth he caused you to see his great fire. And you heard his words in the midst of the fire. But why, verse 37 tells you, why did he do this? Why did God choose a people for himself? Why did God bring a people out of another nation to be his own people? Verse 37, because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them. 
And he personally brought you from Egypt by his great power, dispossessing before you nations greater and mightier than you to bring you in and to give you their land for an inheritance as it is today. Know therefore today and take it to your heart that Yahweh, he is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. So you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I am commanding you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may prolong your days on the land which Yahweh your God is giving you all of your days. Right. Moses writes to remind Israel of the character of their God, right? Remember his righteous and wise rules. Remember the consequences of disobedience. But also, no, underlining all of this, the motivation for all of this obedience that he's calling you to, just remember his love, right? Remember his amazing divine love. Be humbled by that. Be amazed by that. Not because of my righteousness, not because of my greatness, but because of his love. Looking down in mercy at my pitiful condition and sin and rescuing me out of it. Israel can say out of Egypt, you can say out of sin, the bondage and slavery of sin, right? That is who our God is, a God who acts in love. But there's another little part here. Um, Throughout all of it, I know this is a really long kind of purpose statement, but I thought, why not? Why not? You've already read all five books. Why not just have a really long purpose statement, right? Um, Throughout it all, Moses, I would say, weaves the most important reminder of all. The most important reminder of all, the inability of God's people, the inability of God's people to keep covenant apart from divine enablement, right? This is the theme that we've started to see um, throughout Numbers and Leviticus and Exodus, but now it's crystallized in Deuteronomy. As Moses is commanding God's people to love the Lord their God because of his great divine love for them. He is also saying, you can't do it. Matter of fact, I don't know if you remember from Joshua, but this is kind of how Joshua ends too. Israel, love God, turn away from idols. You can't, right? What kind of a message is that? But this is what we see all throughout the Old Testament. This reminder, you cannot keep this law. You need divine enablement. And that is why in Deuteronomy itself, while God is making his law to Israel, he is already saying this law is not able to save you. You need another covenant. You need a new covenant, a new covenant of enablement from within that will cause you to know and see and hear and do. So all throughout this, God is constantly calling them to obey, giving them reason after reason after reason for why they should love the Lord their God with all their heart, their soul, and their mind. But all in all, he is saying, you cannot do it apart from the new covenant. So that's kind of the why statement. Let's move to the next slide. Let's just, let's just kind of like break down Deuteronomy. And I'll try, to be, I'll try to be fast, but man, I just Deuteronomy is a really, really amazing, wonderful, rich book. And we need to just work through it a little bit here. Um, <laughs> what do you need to remember to know life? And you saw that kind of in Deuteronomy 4, right? Deuteronomy 4, we saw this. You need, you need a prolonged life. You want a prolonged life. And you can only have a prolonged life and a good life and a happy life if you obey the Lord your God and love him fully. But what do you need to remember to live this, live this life that he calls his people to Live. This kind of gets us into the structure. Now, just really, really, uh, just a side note: the the book of Deuteronomy follows a pattern that is um, easy to see, a kind of a structure that's easy to see, and it's a it's a it's an outline that a lot of ancient Near East covenants used. So, like a Hittite covenant uh, would use this pattern, and that's also why it's it's very clear to us that this was written in kind of the second. Uh, the second millennium and not the first millennium. Remember, B.C. is, is working backwards from our vantage point. So this is, from, this is from a time when you could see covenants just like this all throughout the ancient world of a, a king making a covenant or a treaty with his people. Matter of fact, it was often a king making a covenant with 
his own subjects. Now, there are some differences. Usually the king wouldn't command obedience. It was kind of assumed, if you guys don't, if you guys don't obey, I'll kill you. But here, this is a little different. In Deuteronomy, God is exhorting, giving reasons and reasons and reasons after, after why you should obey. So it's a little different, but there are there's strong parallels as well. Obedience, obedience to me means life, blessing. Disobedience means death and a cursing. That's what you see in Deuteronomy. But let's just kind of walk through it. First off, number one, uh, this is the first kind of section of Deuteronomy. This is kind of a historical a preamble, you could say, like, a hey, let's get up to speed historically on where we're at here in Deuteronomy. We're right at the banks of Jordan. And the first thing that Moses wants us to know is remember where you came from, right? I think that's really good for, for everyone, every, every believer in every age of God's redemptive history. You should always be remembering where you came from. Otherwise, you're going to get proud and you're going to get arrogant. You're not going to remember the great love and grace of God, but remember where you came from. The, the basic point of these first four chapters is basically uh, God has saved you. God has brought you this far. You've seen his great power and his might, but you have rebelled. Like that's, that's four chapters, right? You were an idiot. You rebelled. It's your fault, Israel. You rebelled against such a great and powerful God. Matter of fact, look over at Deuteronomy chapter 1. This is interesting. Deuteronomy 1 uh, this is interesting, as opposed to everything else I'm about to say, I guess. Uh, Deuteronomy 1, verse 3. Now it happened in the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that Yahweh had commanded him to give to them after he had struck down Sion, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in um, Ashtaroth and uh, Edre, across the Jordan in the land of Moab. Uh, Moab, Moses undertook to expound this law. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that, that's a good verse too. Uh, I was actually going after chapter one, verse two. In the eleven day, it is a, a, sorry. It is eleven days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. He just gives you kind of a, a little a little background. Hey, you guys, you know how long it takes to get from Mount Sinai to the Promised Land? 11 days. How long did it take you guys to get to the promised land? 40 years and 11 months. Right? You need to remember your history, in other words, right? If you, if you fail to remember your history, you're going to be doomed to what? Those who fail to remember history are doomed to repeat, doomed to repeat it. Yeah, you guys, you got it. Right? And right Remember that it could have only taken you 11 days, but instead you grumbled and complained. Therefore, we're here today because of God's power and because it's all your fault. Right? Remember where you came from. Number two, remember this covenant at Sinai. Remember this covenant at Sinai. Now, once again, in these opening um, chapters of Deuteronomy, you, you see this is the, the main section here, but the main idea here is Moses wants to get Israel all the way back to Sinai. He's almost like putting them in their parents' shoes at Sinai, giving them a vivid look at the smoke from Mount Sinai and remembering all of the things that they've learned from God. He even repeats the very command, the Ten Commandments of God from Mount Sinai. Once again, right? Remember this covenant at Sinai, he tells them. This is a huge section, the longest section in Deuteronomy. Matter of fact, it is nearly half of imperatives. It's command after command after command after command, and it's rooted in this idea, remember the covenant at Sinai. And, 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 and all throughout this, you probably saw all these little laws and all these kinds of things, and, and really all these laws are doing are fleshing out those big ten commandments, right? This is how you live out the big ten commandments. But, but remember this, God is commanding more than just obedience. He's actually commanding love. Matter of fact, if we go over to Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12, it says this, so now Israel, what does Yahweh your God ask from you but to fear Yahweh your God, to walk in all of his ways, and to love him and serve Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all of your soul and to keep the commandments of Yahweh and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. Right? This is what God's really after, right? This is what will show itself. How do you know you love God? Well, you obey him, right? 
How do you know you love God? Well, you'll love the ones that God has put in your life. And that's what you see through this commands, right? Matter of fact, I would divide the section. Here, go, go, and go. Next time, next one. I would divide the section into two parts. I'm really clever here with the language, as you can tell. Right? First off, you must, God says, love me holy. You must love me holy. Deuteronomy, this is the first, uh, you know, six or so chapters. Basically, all God is doing is giving reasons after reasons after reasons for why Israel should love them holy. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love Yahweh your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. You must love me, right? Ultimately, that's what God wants. More than obedience, he wants love. Because out of a loving heart, comes obedience. Out of a loving heart comes a rich relationship with God that has obedience in it. And that's why the second part, this is how you show me, right? You must love me wholly, and this is how you show me. And then God, uh, kind of Moses works through all the nitty gritty of how you show, demonstrate your love for God. And guess what? It looks a lot like love for neighbor, right? That's what you see in Deuteronomy 12, 1 through 26, 19. Matter of fact, Around this section, um, around this section, 12, 1 through 26, this, this large section of Deuteronomy, you, you kind of see these, these mountains, these mountains that are, are picturing something. Yeah, at the very beginning of the law of God, you see them reference the, these two mountains in the promised land where Israel will cross over the Jordan and then they'll stand on this and one, one one half of the, 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 uh, the Israelites will stand on one mountain and another half of the Israelites will stand on the other mountain and they'll shout curses and blessings at each other. Uh, but, but, but that's not saying they're cursing each other. They're saying this is what the curses are if we disobey God and these are what the blessings are if we obey God. It's a very vivid picture. And you actually see these mountains bookending this whole section of God's command, right? This is how you show me, Right? This is how you know that you have blessings in your life, or this is how you will quickly show that you're going to have curses in your life if you don't do this. But this is all under the section, remember this covenant of Sinai. Um, next section here, remember what I will do to you if you don't, right? God wants you to know what's going to happen to you if you do not obey this commandment, if you do not love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. Once again, this is very much like those ancient covenants that were paralleled to this covenant in those days where a king would be very explicit about what he would do to you if you disregarded his covenant. Matter of fact, at the end of Deuteronomy, you see 27 through 28, you, you see a little bit of blessing there at the beginning of chapter 28, 1 through 14. But mainly what you see in Deuteronomy 27 through 28 is cursing. Cursing comes before the blessing, and then blessing, and then like 68 verses of cursing, right? But do you think God's trying to make a point? If you disregard this covenant, if you do not love me with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, these are the curses that you can find, on, you find yourself in. This is what I will do to you if you don't. Matter of fact, and I've kind of said this already, in Deuteronomy, as suggested by the blessing and cursing sections, but in Deuteronomy, you'll notice quickly, there is this expectation that Israel will fail, right? Moses is speaking to them knowing they are going to fail. And you see this in Deuteronomy 4, verse 25. When you become the father of children and children's children and remain long in the land, then you will act corruptly, corrupt, uh, corruptly and make graven images, it's, Moses is expecting it, right? You're going to do this when you enter the land. And then in Deuteronomy 31, you see this as well. Deuteronomy 31, verse 1. So Moses spoke, or went and spoke these words to all of Israel. Oh, that's jump back. 30, verse 1. I'm sorry. Uh, 30 verse 1, Deuteronomy, uh, so it will be when all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you cause these things 
to happen. Look, so it will be. This will happen. The blessing and the curse will come upon you. And then De- Deuteronomy 31 verse 16 says this, and Yahweh said to Moses, behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers and this people will arise and play the harlot with foreign gods of the land in the midst of which they are going and they will forsake me and they will break my covenant which I have cut with them. Full expectation that Israel is going to fail, right? How's this for a covenant, right? How's this, how would this feel if you're Israel walking into this, right? This is what I'm going to do to you if you don't, and you can expect that you won't. Um, But this moves to our next section. Remember your future hope. Now you would maybe think, this is kind of a downer of a book, right? Here we have this great, wonderful God who will greatly curse us if we disobey and do not love him, and he's basically telling us we won't. What kind of a hopeful, encouraging message is this before we go into the promised land? But Deuteronomy also has this massive piece of remembering your hope. This exhortation to obedience and expectation of disobedience is the expectation of life apart from the power of God through the new covenant, right? Uh, Deuteronomy 28 is what you can expect without God's enabling power, right? God cannot make a covenant with sinful man and expect us to love him because our hearts are twisted, right? Matter of fact, Deuteronomy uh, 29 verse 4 says just about this. Yet to this day Yahweh has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear, right? Yahweh knows this people will disobey. Why? Because they have a spiritual problem. They do not have eyes to hear, a heart to uh, believe, or ears to hear. Matter of fact, this is kind of the problem, right? You have a, a heart problem. Matter of fact, Moses will say, you've been rebels since the day I knew you. That's Deuteronomy 9, verse 29. You just says right to their face, you've been rebels since the day I've known you from the very beginning. You've been rebels. And, and that's what you guys were all trying to do this last uh, two weeks ago, trying to count out how many times um, Israel was rebelling in numbers. It's impossible. They're just constantly rebelling. And that's what Moses knows as well. Apart from the enabling grace of God, you are stiff-necked, he said. Rebels. And this is where And this is where this promise of a curse actually turns into a blessing. Because you see in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 30 especially, this hope not only of failure, but also of future life. So turn over to Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. So it will be when all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I set before you. And then notice this. Something will happen. You will cause these things to return to your heart in all the nations where Yahweh your God has banished you, and you will return to Yahweh your God and listen to his voice with all of your heart and soul according to all that I am commanding you today, you and your sons. Then Yahweh your God will return you from captivity and return his compassion on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where Yahweh your God has scattered you. If those of you who are banished are at the ends of the sky, from there Yahweh your God will gather you, and from there he will take you back. And Yahweh your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you will possess it, and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Moreover, Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love Yahweh your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul so that what? You may live. Notice this. God's going to change your heart, right? And and notice this is immediately attached to Israel, right? In in the future, I'm going to bring you back to the land and not just bring you back to the land to be the same old Israelites again. I'm going to change your heart so that you love the Lord your God from your heart, right? And know God from your heart, and have eyes to see and trust God from your heart. And then I will cause all of the blessings that I promised to the patriarchs to shower upon you. This is a future covenant blessing that we 
are beginning to sneak into here in the church age, right? We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, the Holy Spirit who circumcises our hearts so that we can know God and love Him. Apart from the Spirit, you do not love God. That's, that's the ultimate statement that the New Covenant makes. Of course, this New Covenant comes with all of these blessings, but they're, they're ultimately to Israel. You see, they're, they're going to come in the last days. Israel will seek and find the Lord. Deuteronomy 4, verse 28, they'll have new hearts. They'll have God's Word in their heart, which, which basically means they will fear God, right? You will hear God's Word, and you will tremble under it and delight in it. Uh, maybe you've had these experiences with the Word God. It's the sign that the Holy Spirit is in you, working on your heart, that you're convicted by the Spirit of God through the Word of God, causing you to fear God more. That is the promise of the New Covenant. But that's ultimately a promise given to Israel because of all of the promises to the patriarchs that are restored through it. Matter of fact, that's another quality of the New Covenant, right? I'm going to give you back your land, and I'm going to give you new hearts in your land so that you'll love me. And then you'll be the nation, the kingdom of priests that I called you to be. And all of the world will look to you and say, what a wise, what a loving, what a merciful, what a, what a gracious God. Is there God? But that isn't even happened yet. But, but ultimately, the bottom line is, you need what only God can provide to obey what God commands. But that's what God provides in the new covenant. But let's move on. Uh, you also need to remember this song. Songs are memorable things. Once you get them in your head, triple dent gum doesn't leave. It's just in there, rattling around forever, constantly being brought back to your mind. And God, in his wisdom, made us people that remember songs and the messages of songs very well, sometimes to annoying degrees. But Moses finishes finishes Deuteronomy after talking about this great new covenant hope that they have to look forward to with a song. Now this is in Deuteronomy 31 through 32 essentially and it doesn't look like a song to you because it's Hebrew poetry but I'm sure it was a beautiful song. Um, but this song mainly deals with Israel's coming apostasy, right? You're going to be in the land, you're going to become fat on the land and then you're going to be then you're going to become arrogant, right? then you're going to reject God in all of the blessing, right? We talked about this with James, right? Sometimes God tries us with trouble, and sometimes God tries us what? With what? With blessing. How do you respond when life is good? Do you forsake God? And this is what Moses is singing in this song, to mainly remind Israel that they will fail. But then, of course, the song ends on a surprising, unexpected note of hope, it pictures this scene at the end of the song where Jews and Gentiles are together glorifying their God who has, who has come to their cause and taken up their cause and rebuked their enemies. So this is talking about some future day when God will punish his enemies and their enemies. And this, is, this is only makes sense to us when we look at it through the gospel. How can God punish all of his enemies and, and that be a good thing for me? Only if I am no longer his enemy anymore. Only if God has totally done away with my sin and already poured out his wrath on my sin through a substitutionary sacrifice. Then God's enemies can become my enemies without me becoming God's enemies, right? And I can join the people of God in exalting God in how he has fully punished his enemies. But this leads us to uh, pass the song to uh, the, the final remembrance, the final part of Deuteronomy. Basically, Moses says, remember my last words. Once again, the book of Deuteronomy could cause you defeat. But that's only if you're looking at Deuteronomy without the promise of the new covenant blessing. And, and how can Moses now end on the note of blessing, even after talking about how you guys have been rebels since the day I knew you, and you will fail Yahweh again, how can he end on a note of blessing? And this is actually legitimate blessing. He is blessing every single tribe except for Simeon, who's probably, probably going to be wrapped up in Judah pretty soon, so that's maybe why that happens. But, but Moses is actually declaring blessing on Israel, even though they're going into the land and they're going to forsake Yahweh their God. How can he do that? Only through the hope of a God who is living. Not, not because 
Moses can trust in the hearts of people or the hearts of the Israelites, but because he can trust in the God who gives his people hope and blessing through the power of the Holy Spirit. And is even faithful to them throughout the wilderness years of discipline so that they can hope in him in this land. And this is why Moses speaks these words of blessing. Now, probably Moses spoke these words right before he went up the mountain to die. And probably somebody else wrote down these words of blessing and then recorded them later because right after this, Moses goes up to the mountain to die. But the the end of the day, Israel is blessed. Matter of fact, I want you to look at it. Turn over to Deuteronomy 30, 30, 30, 33. I'm in Judges for some reason. Yeah, 33. Israel is blessed. But no, notice how this blessing is bookended, okay? Deuteronomy 33 mainly is this word of blessing, and then 34 is Moses' death. But notice, because they have a divine warrior. In 33, verse 2, Yahweh came from Sinai. He dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the midst of 10,000 holy angels. At his right hand there was flashing lightning for them. Indeed, he loves the people. All your holy ones are in your hand, and they follow in your steps. Everyone is bearing up your words. Moses commanded us with a law, a possession for the assembly of Jacob. He was king in Jeshurun. When the heads of the people were gathered, the tribes of Israel together, right? Yahweh has come to his people as a conquering warrior, and he has rescued them from Egypt. And he will rescue them again from a greater Egypt as well. Matter of fact, notice how it refers to Yahweh, at least in your LSB, right? He was king in Jeshurun. This is a God speaking, a king speaking to his people. And here we see this song of blessing because their God is with them. And then, of course, 33, verse 26, There is none like the God of Jeshurun who rides the heavens to your help. And through the skies in his majesty, the eternal God is a dwelling place. And underneath are the everlasting arms. He drove out the enemies from before you and said, destroy. So Israel dwells in security. The fountain of Jacob uh, secluded in a land of grain and new wine. His heavens also drop down dew. Blessed are you, O Israel. Who is like you? A people saved by Yahweh. Who is the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty? So your enemies will cower before you, and you will tread upon their high places. End of the day, Israel, you are walking into this land, but you are a blessed people, not because of who you are, not because you're great and mighty, but because your God is greater. Your God is your dwelling place. Even when you're scattered to the ends of the earth, your God is your dwelling place. By the way, Psalm 90, the Lord is our dwelling place from all generations was also written by Moses, probably at this time, right? That is the the end message, right? Even when you fall into the curse, you still have a dwelling place in God. You still know a God who can gather you back and will give you new hearts to know him and to love him. Um, That's Deuteronomy. Um, Next slide here real quick. Here's just some thoughts I had on why this matters to you, but I really want you guys to talk amongst yourself about perhaps why the message of Deuteronomy has a lot to say to someone like you. But let's pray really quick. Dear God in heaven, we're thankful for this day that you've given us. Thank you for your love. Your, your, your love that did not find worth in us, but chose us just to reveal the greatness of your love and your wise wisdom. Just like Israel, so you have loved us. We had nothing to, to boast in to be proud about, but all we can exalt in and rejoice in is you as the God who calls and saves and delivers and rescues and even sustains us. We pray that this, these words of this book would even sink into our hearts and cause us to hear and fear so that we may do. Amen.